next speaker is Professor Kripa Varanasi. He is at the Department of Mechanical Engineering, and uh, we will now be deepening our understanding about what seems to be happening in the area of new materials. Uh, Kripa is also, of course, a serial entrepreneur. We try to, I hope you see a pattern here. We're not just bringing you professors with uh, big brains. We're bringing you very applied men's at Manus. We're bringing you MIT live. Welcome, Kripa. Right, thank you so much for having me here. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, so what I'll tell you today about is interfaces. And interfaces are everywhere, whether it be um, whether you're transporting mass across things, or whether you're doing charge transport, or uh, energy transport. Everything happens at interfaces. And I believe that uh, changing interfaces can fundamentally change many things and improve efficiency in a whole range of different systems. Um, <coughs> so. Uh, as I said, applications are across multiple industries, multiple disciplines, and uh, what you're seeing here is a uh, sort of areas that we work on, but there are a whole range of other things that we, are, we, are, we, we can apply these technologies. So in power plants, for example, if you're able to change any of these processes where you're boiling uh, or condensing or improving steam turbine efficiency, you can literally stop global warming because 85% of our electricity flows through steam cycles. Right? So, uh, and in fact, I think you must have heard from Dropwise today and how they're doing it. They're going to transform the power industry. Uh, you can think about solar. All the great solar materials are great, uh, but there is also the problem of something as mundane as dust. Right? So dust accumulation on panels kills efficiency by a percent every week. And what you do is you clean these panels with billions of gallons of water. And where are all these panels? They're in desert where water is scarce. So you need technologies that can completely you know, eliminate this dust problem uh, if, you are going to make, um, if you are going to make it sustainable. If you think about icing, 5% uh, of engine efficiency goes into preventing ice buildup. Uh, and so on and so on. I can keep going on forever. Right? So oil and gas, you, know, you can think about flow, flow assurance, which is clearly an interfacial problem. Uh, we are also looking at improving, say, LNG efficiency. Um, and I'll tell you stories about food packaging, how you know, I didn't even think about, I never thought I'd work on ketchup bottle, but you know, so things like that happen at MIT, right? And <laughs> uh, agriculture, thermal desalination, you name it. Name anything. Interfaces are everywhere. And if you can fix them, there's a huge uh, potential. So my approach is, you know, we need the basic science to fundamentally change and par uh, shift paradigms in technology. But we also need to think about scale up and manufacturing along with that and in parallel so that you're not spending, you know, n years developing the technology and, you know, n more years sort of trying to make it scale, you know, scale that up. And so the result of that was in the last five years, we were able to spin off two companies. Uh, one is Liquid Glide, and the other is Dropwise. And you must have heard about that from Adam, and I see uh, David and Anika here. Uh, so what I'll try to do is kind of walk you through these steps and see where, how we are, what we are doing in these companies. So one of the key areas, uh, when, when I got started about, I think it's six years now, uh, we are looking at surfaces that can slippery to a whole range of different things. So we call them omni-slippery surfaces. And so the idea was inspired also by a lot of issues in oil and gas and various other industries. Uh, so for example, in oil and gas, you have several sticky problems, whether it be you know, buildup of asphaltines or hydrates or hard to transport things like bitumen and uh, you know, sensors that are downhole, you know, doing all kinds of measurements, but you, know, you need barrier coatings and so on and so forth. So that led to thinking about, can you make a surface that you know, is self-healing is uh, you can you know, slip a whole range of different materials, say from ice to ketchup, <laughs> which you know, became sort of the uh, poster child for this technology. Uh, so the idea was you know, there is this whole, uh, there is a whole uh, uh, work going on for, a, for over a decade or two decades on using uh, surface texturing. It's called the lotus effect. And you, know, you can have drops bounce off. You can have beautiful movies that you can make. But it's so limited only to water and also limited to uh, you know, nice, gently placed water droplets on surfaces. And if you like rub it, it's, cry, it's gone. You, know, you don't really can make it work. So we think about it and say, look, we need to get it to market. What are you going to do about it? So we said, let's change the, uh, uh, the air that's in there 
in, in these textures and put in an oil. It's, it's a very simple idea which, you all, which we all use in our kitchen when you're making, you know, in India we make something called dosas. Uh, I don't know if there are Indians here, but you, know, you kind of make dosas that, uh, it's like pancake, right? And so you put a lot of oil and uh, the, that makes it from sticking, uh, preventing it to stick to the pan. But eventually that oil goes away and you know, it doesn't work. Right. So, but the point is, we said, okay, we can make that effect permanent, and we can make that effect permanent not only on a frying pan but everywhere else, right? And so, how do you do that? So, we think about textures. So, we use nanotechnology where you can think about small features that can, where you, where capillary forces become important and can trap liquids. But we also think about intermolecular forces like Van der Waals forces that can help. So, anyway, the net result is you get these beautiful slippery surfaces. It's a permanently wet surface. So you use a, uh, you know, I call it oil, but a lubricant that uh, is immiscible. So suddenly what you have done is a coating is no longer a solid material. You have changed it, you have transformed it, you are looking at a solid and liquid combination. And so it provides you a whole range of material space. And now we can make these coatings out of food. You can eat them uh, for applications where, you are, where it's a food related thing. If I'm going to oil and gas, I can do you know, other materials. So it, it, it give, completely opens up the design space. So the result is, you know, I have now, uh, by simply tuning certain properties, I can completely change the mobility. So here, you know, the same sort of materials and changing their combinations, I can go from something that is highly slippery to something that is, you know, going slowly, right? So, you know, we, and each of these can have applications. So, uh, so, you know, I had to show this slide because it's all based in the science of the thermodynamics of how all this works. There is a whole, you know, we, we spent a lot of time understanding this. Uh, it's a, you know, you have air, you have the solid, you have the lubricant, you have, your, uh, you have your product that you want to slide off. And you need to really think of the basic science. Without that, you know, you'll be incremental. You'll be like shooting in the dark, right? So we have an algorithm and that algorithm helps us even today to develop coatings for a whole range of different materials. So, and the result was, okay, we said let's, you know, we want to, we want to take this technology to market and what do we do? And uh, early on, you know, we had this idea of, you know, we can maybe put this in bottles because uh, it's a contained environment, we can take it to market quickly. I don't know if these things play. So this is the, uh, the, the uh, bottle without a coating and this is a bottle with the coating, right? And you see that you are able to completely evacuate every last bit of the product, right? And, um, and you know, when, since we know the thermodynamics of the process, we could easily select materials. This was all done in a weekend by these amazing you know, students uh, in the group. And <clears throat> so, what, so the, the result here is you have a coating that is no longer Teflon or no longer fluoropolymer based. It is food. You can eat the coating, right? And therefore, uh, you know, it becomes so, uh, you know, becomes very easy to trans translate into the market. You can do crazy things with this. You can do things like uh, mayonnaise, which is, you know, extremely hard. It's a Bingham plastic. So you can't even get it to slide, but with this, you know, you can easily slide off very hard, you know, high, highly viscous fluids. So we think of these coatings as though, you know, wheels are to transportation, uh, these coatings are to liquids. And we work with hundreds of different of liquids, you know. <coughs> Bingham plastics, all kinds of different rheological properties. We can come up with coatings that can uh, be slippery to a whole range of different uh, materials. So, Who among us hasn't been guilty then of the media took over, which was great. <laughs> technology finally caught up with ketchup. Look at that thing uh, slide. Amazing. Oh my God. Our long national nightmare is over. Mechanical engineering students at MIT have come up with a super that, slippery coating that makes anything from ketchup to mayonnaise practically leap out of a bottle coated with the stuff. They call it liquid glide. Even Tony Soprano would be beholden to these students. Look how annoyed Tony gets at the dreaded ketchup clog. And if Carlos starts talking homicide. Liquid glide, let it slide. No more banging with shoes or mallets or sucking up ketchup. For traditional bottles, liquid glide could mean their last gasp. Gimo, CNA. So the incredible thing was we had all this media attention, which uh, you know did all our marketing, and we had 2,000 companies calling us to you know, take this to market or asking us for products. And then, you know, 100K competitions and the mass challenge, all of these helped to spread that word. We won awards and, 
you know, we said, look, this is the time to take it to market and really, you know, start the company. Dave Smith, uh, who was uh, actually leading all of this work, uh, became, you know, the CEO of the company and we started the company. And he had to, uh, he was just six months away from graduating probably, but he said, like, this is the opportunity. And, uh, you know, he kind of dropped out, not really dropped out, took a leave of absence. So he's going to be, I'm hoping, coming back to finish his PhD. But, uh, but anyway, so the exciting thing was, um, Look, then we found thousands and thousands of applications because of the uh, platform technology that we had. And so how do we then take it to, take it to market? You know, we had, uh, this is August of 2012, we founded Liquid Glide. Uh, by uh, January of 2013, we moved into a lab space that you see here, which is in a basement in one candle square. We had a uh, lot of people calling us uh, saying, you know, can you give, give us a coating? So we came up with interesting business models because there was no product like this before. Right? So we had to say, okay, you can't compare it to anything in the market. So we had to think about what kind of business models would actually make this work. So we had to innovate on, in that uh, phase as well. And uh, so the result was, you know, we had to also think about scale up and manufacturing, which we were doing already in the lab. So it was easy to sort of take it forward. I don't know if this thing is going to play. Can you play this, please? <coughs> so this is very early on. So I think Gen Zero, uh, very uh, early on. But you see that uh, we have. A, we have a process where we can spray uh, spray liquids that actually uh, nucleate and form the textures that form the textures of the co uh, liquid glide coating, and then we can spray the lubricant. So it's all sort of now embedded in this system. So it's done. The coating is done. So it doesn't take you know like for a, a whole day to make this coating. It's done in like few seconds. Now we can do it in less than a second, right? So then the opportunities, as I said, are endless. So we can go to things like uh, you see. Uh, this is a drug, like uh, this is Pepto-Bismol, like, uh, and you can completely evacuate it. So, uh, so many, many times in drug industry, the problem is you don't know how much you're dispensing. So it's paints, you have things like blood. We are looking at you know, preventing blood clots. You have uh, like toothpaste. Uh, soon your toothpaste package will change. This is how it will look like. <clears throat> and you have something as crazy as peanut butter, right? Uh, you know, taking it out with a spoon is a pain. Uh, you can you can have a squeeze bottle for peanut butter, <laughs> and uh, then you know you can move on. So this is uh, can you play this? Okay, yeah, I'll 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 end. <laughs> have you ever gone to the end of your toothpaste tube and have to squeeze out and roll up the end to get that last bit of product out? Yes, yeah, so I'm I'm actually fastidious about that. Yeah, I had to do that this morning. It's terrible, and you lose money. Very annoying. Absolutely. Of course. Yeah, I usually work for that last little bit. You did it this morning. Yes, to cut the toothpaste tube in half. All the time. I'm going to invite you to take these two products in your hand, play around with them, upside down if you use them, and just let me know what you notice. So this one comes down really easily, and this mm -hmm. one gets stuck. This one sticks, this one doesn't. This one falls to the bottom. Right. So I don't have to lose anything. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, this one, whoa, what is this? <laughs> so I wanted to end on that note, but there are a lot of other things we're doing in oil and gas, and we have sort of taken these to, we're taking these to markets. So it's uh, no longer in consumer packaging, but uh, truly industrial applications, where we are now coating big paint tanks to empty out uh, paint completely. Uh, in, that, in those cases, 10% uh, of the cost of paint goes into cleaning these tanks because it becomes the cleaning, the cleaning fluid, like if you clean it with water, water becomes hazardous, so you have to like treat it. Um, so the same technology can be applied to other things like oil tanks and other kinds of whole tank industry. Um, I also, I think I'm out of time, but I also wanted, I, I presume that Adam has done a good job with the whole dropwise stuff, but uh, but you know, I'm well, you know, I'd love to also chat about dropwise in the uh, you know when we have some we time. Have time in the past, yeah.